Oral questions by members? Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, whether it's his failed decriminalization policies, two credit downgrades, or the carbon tax kickback scandal, this Premier just reels from one crisis to the next. Instead of defending local manufacturers like Edison Motors, the Premier tried to block an investigation into the scandal of NDP appointed consultants charging a 20% carbon tax kickback for giving away government money. Now, we've received a letter from the Auditor General stating that they have yet to receive the explosive new information that prompted the Premier to flip flop over to damage control. As the Premier would well know, the Auditor General is entitled to complete and unrestricted access to all NDP files immediately. So my question to the Premier, why would the Premier be sneaky about this and not disclose all the information to the Auditor General and will he publicly release both the damning new evidence and the full MNP contract immediately? Mr. Premier. Uh, uh, the members of this place uh, all voted together on Monday to send this matter to the Auditor General to get the answers that the public of British Columbia deserves uh, and to address the issues that have been raised by Edison. Uh, the Auditor General has written to this House, uh, CC'd all the House leaders uh, in response to our request. Of course. Uh, government will send all the information to the Auditor General. I encourage all, encourage all parties to share any information that they have with the Auditor General, and the Auditor General will do this important work. Uh, we're also doing legal review on our ability to release uh, that contract and uh, hope to be able to release it as soon as possible. Leader of the Official Opposition Supplemental. Well, thank you. Well, Mr. Premier, if there's some skepticism in the public and the opposition about the record of this government when it comes to transparency, and releasing memos and information, you can understand where it comes from. The fact of the matter is the British Columbians were awfully surprised to learn that the carbon tax dollars they're paying at the pump uh, were going into the pockets of highly paid consultants in the form of a 20% carbon tax kickback just for handing out government money. Now, shockingly, the minister has apparently known about this all along. The opposition has obtained documents that confirm the NDP not only knew about the carbon tax kickback, but signed off on them. I will quote from the request for proposals from the Clean BC Industry Fund, a $215 million carbon tax slush fund, and I quote directly, a final payment of 20% of the total provincial share of funding will be provided upon completion of the study and submission to the service delivery agent, end of quote. And who is the lucky service delivery agent, I wonder? Why, by gosh, it's MNP. So my question to the Minister, Mr. Speaker, is why would the Minister sign off on the practice of paying MNP up to $43 million through a 20% carbon tax kickback scheme just for handing out government money? Mr. Premier. Uh, thank you, Honourable Speaker. Uh, when the members sat on this side of the House, uh, they used MNP to administer programs. The Auditor General himself uses MNP to administer programs. Uh, and uh, the members are uh, uh, not correct. Uh, our grants are very clear that you cannot use grant money for consultant fees. Uh, and uh, this is one of the matters uh, that the Auditor General will look at. And uh, we look forward to him reporting to the Legislature as soon as possible. Absolute West. Thanks, Honourable Chair. The, the facts are beginning to emerge, and it's hardly the result of the government being particularly forthcoming. I need to remind uh, the Premier, uh, Honourable Speaker, that uh, it was only uh, last week when he and his government did everything possible to avoid and prevent this matter from being reviewed by the Auditor General. What we know thus far is that the Clean Energy BC Fund has handed out uh, about $215 million. Uh, over the course of the last three years, taxpayer payments to MNP uh, have increased dramatically and over that three-year period uh, are the equivalent of uh, $72 million. $72 million, Mr. Speaker. These are allegations around a breach of the public trust. And the facts that we know thus far 
take the matter directly uh, into the Minister's office. Yesterday I asked the Attorney General about the Office of a Special Prosecutor created specifically to address circumstances like this. Her refusal to answer the question yesterday raises serious questions about what actually is taking place. So I'm going to ask her again, given these circumstances, given the allegations of a breach of the public trust, given the investigations that we already know are taking place, can she confirm that a special prosecutor has been appointed to examine this matter? And if not, why not? Minister of Energy and Mines. Thank you so much, Honourable Speaker. And uh, thank you to the member for the question. And again, I, I remind the House that all funding programs must be fair to applicants. We know this. And we know, too, that the public trust is paramount, that the responsible management of public funds is paramount. Mr. Speaker, we received concerns through my office about two specific programs. And all along, we've taken action with the information that we've had at hand. So, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, when we received new information that raised serious questions, further questions, the appropriate thing to do, the right thing to do, is to refer it to the Auditor General. And that's where it is because, Mr. Speaker, that's the appropriate place, a neutral, independent, fair body to examine these issues, to provide a report back to British Columbians so we can all get to the bottom of this, Mr. Speaker. Member for Abbotsford West Supplemental. The minister's story keeps changing. The government's approach keeps changing. And amidst all of that, uh, the Attorney General refuses to answer a very basic question about a process that this House created to address circumstances precisely like this. The Attorney's a lawyer. She knows about the inference that will be drawn from her refusal to answer this question. She knows the inference that will be drawn. So I'll ask her again. She's the chief legal officer to this government and in British Columbia in circumstances where allegations of the breach of the public trust are being made. They haven't been proven, but they are being made. And those allegations go to the doorstep of one of her colleagues, the Minister for Energy. Has a special prosecutor been appointed? If not, why not? Energy and Mines. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Once again, you know, late last night, this House received a letter from the Auditor General initiating the review process, a process that needs to have the respect and the integrity to follow through so that British Columbians can get answers for the questions that we all have. Mr. Speaker, that's the right place to do this review of these two programs. I know that people want information. I know people want answers. We need to let the Auditor General undertake that process. Members, now, members. Mr. Speaker, the Auditor General, it is his purview to expand the scope of the review as he sees fit. But Mr. Speaker, we need to let him do that work. We are providing all the information to him. I'm sure that all members of this House who have information will also do the same because we respect the role. Mem member. Minister Mr. Will Speaker, continue. because we respect the role of an independent, fair, and neutral Auditor General, and that's the process we'll follow. Thank you. you. House Leader of the Third Party. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Through you to the Premier, will he today require every member of his cabinet whose ministry administers grants of public money to immediately complete an analysis of those grants to ensure that they're meeting the basic ethical standards and require them to report their findings to this Legislative Assembly before the end of this session. Minister. Thank, thank you again, Honourable Speaker, and thank you to the member for the question. And of course, these matters are taken incredibly seriously. This is about the use of public funds. There are concerns and allegations that have come forward around two programs under the Go Electric Commercial Vehicles Program, and that's why Mr. Speaker, with the information that we've received at the time that we've received it, we've come to this House and had the consent of everybody here to send this to the Auditor General, because the Auditor General, again, is the right place to do. And 
as I noted earlier, Mr. Speaker, should the Auditor General decide to expand the review, the scope of that review, it is his purview to do so. But, Mr. Speaker, right now, this House has made it clear to the Office of the Auditor General what we expect. We're going to continue that process. We're going to support that process. We're going to participate in that process fully. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. House Leader, third party supplemental. Mr. Speaker, I'm not sure why the Minister of Energy stood to answer a question that was not implicating in any way a conversation that's been happening previous. This is about a government that administers public money through grants. There are numbers of ministries that do this. Uh, sure, the minister uh, feels implicated because perhaps uh, there's good reason for that. However, the question was very clearly to a premier asking whether or not the premier is going to require other ministers who do other grant programs to review those grant programs and to ensure that they're ba meeting some basic ethical standards. And so my question is, again, to the Premier, not specific to any of the conversations that's been happened, but more general, to the ministers that grant uh, other grant programs, will the Premier require those ministers to review those programs to make sure that they're meeting basic ethical standards and will the premier require those ministers to report back to this house before we adjourn premier uh, thank you uh, honorable speaker uh, we are accounting on the auditor general to do a thorough investigation if there are any other information about any other program members should bring it to the auditor general the auditor general will follow that information where it leads oh please the the opposition when they were in government Ran a grant program. Members, 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 please. Members, wait for your turn. Members will wait for their turn. Premier will continue. Let's just say they ran grant programs seeking quick wins, Honorable Speaker. Our grant programs are about supporting British Columbia businesses in innovation, in clean technology. And the process has to not just be fair, it has to be seen to be fair, especially by those groups that don't get a grant. You have to know the process was fair. And that's what we're asking the Auditor General to look at, and that's what the Auditor General is going to report back to this House. Leader of the Fourth Party. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Victoria's Cool Aid Society receives tens of millions of dollars in taxpayer funding from this NDP government to provide housing and shelters for homeless on Vancouver Island. This week, Conservatives spoke with an anonymous whistleblower who works in one of Cool Aid's housing projects. She is required by WorkSafe BC to wear a gas mask in the housing project she works in because of the amount of drug fumes in the air. So my question to the Premier is this. Does this Premier think it's acceptable that workers in taxpayer-funded facilities have to wear gas masks to prevent the inhalation of drug fumes? Government House Leader. Uh, thank you so much, Honourable Speaker, and, uh, and thanks to the member for the question. Uh, we've been working with the Kool-Aid Society, uh, in particular around this one building uh, that provides support for some of the more vulnerable people in our community, uh, people who uh, find themselves in encampments, sometimes find themselves um, sleeping in parks, uh, trying to get them indoors, trying to get them the supports that they need. Uh, they operate this one particular site since November. We've been working with them. It's an older building, uh, and it has some real challenges with circulation. So in order to address the challenges that were being raised at that site, we've done a couple of things. Um, now, contrary to what the members told the media today, there was never an order issued by WorkSafe. Uh, the Kool-Aid Society proactively went to WorkSafe, went to BC and said, uh, we have a concern. Our, our building is a no-smoking building. No one is supposed to be smoking in the building. The challenge we have is that we, we're telling our residents that they're not supposed to smoke in the building, uh, that there's places for them to smoke outside. We have options to, if we kick them out, they're going to find themselves in a homeless situation. And so how can we mitigate this? So what we're doing is this. We have, um, uh, if uh, only if a staff person suspects that someone is smoking in a room and they have to go knock on the door to engage with them, we're asking them to take precautions for their own safety. We're also moving all of the um, residents of that site out of the building to a new building that has HVAC, has circulation in the building, not only to protect the workers, to protect the uh, tenants, and then that building that we have existing 
will require uh, uh, an upgrade so that everybody can be safe. But, you know, uh, it's easy to punch down on the most vulnerable people, Honourable Speaker. It's easy to punch down on homeless people. It's also easy to score political points to try to make it, uh, to try to lift your own political uh, endeavours. Members, members, mem mem members, members, member, members, enough. Members, we are wasting time, members. Minister will conclude. I was answering the question from the BC Conservatives, but they're quietly listening, and the BC United feels like they have to heckle for some reason, Honorable Speaker. This is a serious question, Honorable Speaker. So, Honorable Speaker, I'll just I'll end with this. It's easy to punch down and score political points on homeless individuals and vulnerable people. We're going to continue to do what we have to do, which is provide people from our communities, our neighbours, our loved ones, a place to be uh, safe, a place to get the supports that they need. Honourable Speaker, we're going to continue that work. Leader of the Fourth Party, Supplemental. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Well, clearly, this program of safe supply and decriminalization is failing, and it is failing once again into yet another crisis. I wonder how many of these people in this facility have actually gone to long-term care or long-term homes uh, by Island Health, and the answer would be virtually zero over the last three years. This seems to be a permanent situation that's going on. Mr. Speaker, what we're seeing here in British Columbia is crisis after crisis. There are so many, quite frankly, that it's hard for people in this province even to keep track of. The sad reality is the NDP's radical policies keeping, keep backfiring and creating problems for everyday, hard-working people who are just trying to make ends meet. It is not normal for people to have to wear a gas mask in a government-funded housing projects. It is not normal for people to be exposed to dangerous fumes in the workplace. We should not accept open drug use. <clears throat> we should not be accepting drug fuel violence, toxic fumes, and this should not be the new normal. Mr. Speaker, once again to the Premier. Will he please explain to everyday hard-working British Columbians why their taxpayer dollars are being used to fund a housing project that has turned into an NDP drug den. Government House Leader. Uh, thank you, Honourable Speaker. Um, we, we know what the BC Conservatives think about homeless populations. It's clear from every question that they ask. It's easy to punch down on vulnerable people to score political points, Honourable Speaker. What this supportive housing site is about is about getting people who are very vulnerable, sometimes have uh, mental health issues, sometimes have addictions issues, or sometimes just find themselves in a really tough situation, to get them indoors, to get them the support they need, Honourable Speaker. That's what this housing is about. And, and it's actually helped a lot of people, helped a lot of people in our community to get that support in their lives. And we're hoping to continue that work around the province. This site has uh, strict no smoking uh, indoor policy, Honourable Speaker. They have implemented a no visitor policy. They've got fencing. They've got things that are measures to put in place, Honourable Speaker, to keep everyone safe. Now, the member seems to be surprised that there's people that have um, uh, addictions issues in our communities. He's surprised that maybe there's people in shelters who have addictions issues. Perhaps he's surprised that we have people who are needing supportive housing that have addictions issues, Honourable Speaker. There are. I mean, if, if that's the breaking news he's trying to share with the House today, congratulations uh, that he just discovered something new. This is something that all of us have already understood. Thank you. But the question for us, Honourable Speaker, through, through you, is what do we do with individuals who are struggling? Do we do what's being offered by the Conservatives, which is just kick them out? Or do we find ways to give them the supports they need, a pathway uh, away from addiction, Honourable Speaker, get them the mental health supports they need? Honourable Speaker, that's what we're doing. We're going to continue to do that work. Member for Surrey South. Thank you, Honourable Speaker. Instead of ending this dangerous experiment fueling a public safety crisis, the Premier prioritizes controlling the narrative. Reliable sources confirm interference from the Minister's office because of NDP embarrassment with the RCMP reporting on seizures of so-called safe supply or hydromorphone. And now there's a gag order to suppress access to public safety information on 
hot-button issues due to pre-election considerations. Police should be free to inform British Columbians about investigations serving the public interest, not to shield the Premier from scrutiny and political embarrassment. Mr. Speaker, will the Premier end the gag order so that frontline and senior detachment police officers can freely speak to journalists? Minister of Public Safety and Solicitor General. Thank you, uh, Honourable Speaker. There is no gag order. Member for Surrey South, supplemental. Yes, thank you, Honourable Speaker. You know, I think that the memo that was leaked to the media was clear. It was very clear. In fact, it talked about hot button issues that people were not supposed to be telling the media because. We're coming up to an election. We don't want to embarrass the government, Mr. Speaker, and nobody is going to believe this Premier. And the Minister can deny it. But reliable sources have confirmed that the Ministry contacted the RCMP and made their intentions known. This is the Premier that's the author of the book on how to sue the police, as he now seeks to muzzle police officers. As undeniable evidence mounts against the NDP's so-called safe supply program and decriminalization, the Premier's response is a sweeping gag order. This gag order covers drug seizures, decriminalization, gun violence, mental health crises, repeat offenders, the failed bail reform, and all areas where this NDP Premier has glaringly failed. Day after day, the Premier's policies make the public safety crisis rather worse Yet his, pro his priority is silencing the police. Question, member. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Instead of a gag order, will this Premier stop his interference, allow police officers to speak with the media, and scrap his soft on crime policies? Here, here. Here, here. Minister of Public Safety. Thank you, uh, Honourable Speaker. I thank the member for the question. I'll start off by saying that reliable sources in the BC United Party are oxymorons, Honourable Speaker. <laughs> There is, there, is, there is no gag order. The Solicitor General and his office does not tell the, the, the police how to do investigations, nor do they, nor do they, nor do they tell the police uh, what their, their communications uh, policies should be, Honourable Speaker. My, my ministry works with police on a regular basis to identify the issues that are important to them and to find out the tools that they need so that we can deal with organized crime in this province. That's why, Honourable, Pro uh, Honourable Speaker, it is this government that put in place a witness security program to ensure that police are able to get the information they need to do significant busts on serious gang crime in this province, which is something that they've been doing and has been incredibly successful, something they could have done and failed to do, Honourable Speaker. It's why, it's why this side of the House, Honourable Speaker, worked with police to identify solutions to deal with making communities safer, which is to put in place the Revoy program, Honourable Speaker, which we've done on a permanent basis, which they had in place and they cancelled, Honourable Speaker. So, Honourable Speaker, we will continue to work with police to make sure that they have the tools they need to keep our, to keep our communities safe. And the police, Honourable Speaker, and E-Division, they will make their own communication policies. Member for Richmond North Centre. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Under this soft-on-crime premier, public safety in Richmond continue to get worse, not better. Shoplifting crimes are up 50 per cent from last year, targeting businesses like New Empire Supermarket on Number 3 Road in my riding. Owner Cindy John says, and I quote her, I don't understand why thieves are not being punished. I think it has sent them a very strong message that there is no consequences for stealing stuff, and it even encouraged them to keep doing so. And hold. When will the Premier stop enabling prolific offenders and finally abandon his failed catch and release policy? Minister. Thank you, uh, Honourable Speaker. Once again, uh, we hear from the opposition uh, on something that simply does not exist. 
Uh, there is no such thing as catch, as catch and release policy. In fact, members, the Honourable Speaker, at the Honourable Speaker, the only thing we get from the members, opposition members. is maybe catching facts and then releasing misinformation, Honourable Speaker. Member. As I've said a moment ago, Honourable Speaker. Ma'am. Leader of the official opposition. Leader of the official opposition. Leader of the official opposition. Please watch your language. Thank Minister. You, Honourable Speaker. Thank you, Honourable Speaker. No, Shaw Pardon's not on, wrong, wrong, Honourable Member. No, but her comments around catch and release are absolutely wrong, and you know that's not wrong. the same judiciary and council that when you sat on this side of the house honorable speaker honorable speaker i know they hate to hear it honorable speaker i know members, they hate to hear it members i i know they hate to hear it honorable speaker member thank you honorable speaker the only thing out of touch was when they sat on this side of the House, Honourable Speaker, and cancelled a repeat, uh, the, the, a repeat, uh, re the Revoy program, which targeted repeat violent offenders, Honourable Speaker. It could have been in place, instead they cancelled it. That's out of touch, Honourable Member. Members. Honourable Speaker. Honourable Speaker, understanding that communities need to be kept safe is why we made the largest investment in policing in the history of this province with 256 RCMP officers for this community right around to keep their communities safe. It's why we have the Safer Communities Initiative, Honourable Speaker. We will work with communities, we will work with police to ensure we keep our communities safe. That's what the public expects and that's what we're going to do. Members, please be careful. Member has supplemental. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. With due respect, Minister, I've been getting calls every day to myself and to my staff that they are not happy with this MPP government failed solve on crime policy. Right. I'm just reporting what I heard from my constituents. Yes, yes. Community deserves safe streets, not the rampant theft, vandalism, and violence from this premier's soft on crime policies. In Richmond, nearly 300 retail thefts have already been reported this year alone. Cindy Chen says, I quote her, I'm a hard working taxpayer who works 13 hours a day. But I feel that my rights are not protected. End quote. With Richmond business under siege by repeat offenders, when will this premier put the rights of victims like Cindy ahead of the rights of criminals to reoffend? Minister of Public Safety. Thank you, uh, Honourable Speaker, and I appreciate uh, the member raising the, the issues. But I also know this. All of us in this House take this issue very seriously. There is no such thing as this side of the House being soft on crime, Honourable Speaker. We have... Members, Just continue. Thank you, Honourable Speaker. That's why we put together the Safer Communities Initiative. Multi-ministries working together to work with communities, to work with police, to put in place what's needed to deal with public safety and to deal with issues that the member raises, Honourable Speaker. And it's unfortunate, Honourable Speaker, that the opposition uh, wants to ignore those initiatives, initiatives that police have asked for, that communities have asked for, and that we have been putting in place and are starting to see results. The Revoy program, Honourable Speaker, seeing results, in, seeing results in communities where it's been put in place, seeing the kinds of crimes that the members talk about are starting to trend down, Honourable Speaker. Changes done with the Federal Criminal Code. That this side of the House, I hear the member, you know, they ask a question and they're, 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 they're trying to give a response and they, they, they want to keep interrupting. Thank you. Anyway, 
Anyway, Honourable Speaker, we, we will continue to work with police, work with communities to put in place the initiatives that they have asked for, the professionals on the street who know what needs to be done, because we take that issue very seriously, Honourable Speaker, in keeping communities safe, and we're going to work to continue to do that. Member for Camelus North Thompson. Thank you, Mr. Strickey. You'd think after 30 years, the Solicitor General would need perfect silence in the chamber to actually answer a question, but apparently he does. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, we have the carbon tax kickback scheme. We have the double credit rating downgrade. We have a failing decrim policies in hospitals and in housing. We have a gag order for the RCMP, Mr. Speaker, and it's only Wednesday. It's only Wednesday. God only knows what it will be like by tomorrow. The Premier's public safety crisis is simply careening out of control. Hospitals are practically war zones where exposure to drugs, knives and weapons are a regular occurrence, just like in BC housing projects as well. Criminals are trafficking taxpayer-funded drugs with impunity. And so far, the only response from the NDP to this crisis has been to actually gag the police from talking about it, Mr. Speaker. This past weekend, the Vancouver Fire Department says that 20 fires were randomly set through the downtown east side, Gastown, and the Strathcona neighbourhoods. Yet to hear this government talk about it, there's no problem with crime, there's no problem with catch and release, and they're certainly not soft on crime. When, when, Mr. Speaker, will this Premier finally acknowledge its failed policies around decrim and public safety and get rid of the soft and crime catch and release system he's responsible for? Minister of Public Safety. Thank you, uh, Honourable Speaker. Nothing illustrates the desperation of the official opposition more than their over-the-top rhetoric, Honourable Speaker, that we have seen. They make statements, they make statements in this House that they would not dare say outside that chamber, Honourable Speaker. Members, members, members. Members, members, we'll take it easy. Members, let, let the minister complete his answer, please. Thank minister. you, Honourable Speaker. I'll remind the, uh, the member, uh, um, because he's, he's clearly, he clearly thinks that, uh, that, uh, that he wants an answer to a question, and he's going to get one. And I'll repeat it again, which is this. This government, since taking office, has taken the issue of public safety incredibly seriously. That's why we put, I know they don't, I know they don't like to hear it, Honourable Speaker. But that's why we, that's why, you know, I know we've got other business, so I'll leave the, I'll leave the leader of the opposition with one, uh, with, with one, with one uh, point, and that is this. We put in place the witness security program, Honourable Speaker, something that he could have done when he sat on this side of the House, but failed to do, Honourable Speaker, failed to do. And he talks about results, Honourable Speaker. 130 difficult to crack gang plate, gang uh, uh, crimes that are in place, gang crimes, Honourable Speaker, and because of that witness security program, more than 70 convictions have been have been made, and evil gang people in jail because of the intelligence they were able to get because of an initiative that this government put in place, Honourable Speaker, that that side of the house failed when they sat. <laughs> The bell ends the question period.